Hi everyone, my name is Nat Guy. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I work in a lab called the Ops Lab at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, and my lab is one small part of JPL, which is one small part of NASA. But we do a lot of things to help support various missions that uh, JPL currently has going. We build interfaces to control spacecraft and to analyze, monitor telemetry that we're getting back from spacecraft. Uh, these can include rovers that are on the ground currently with the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity on the Martian surface as well as Curiosity. Um, this can also include orbiters like we have an orbiter around, Mar uh, around Saturn which is Cassini and uh, upcoming missions like the Europa Clipper to Europa and eventually Europa Lander, we hope. This is not advancing. There we go. Um, but in addition to just the mission of building these interfaces, what we also like to do is we like to experiment with ways that virtual and augmented reality can improve how our users can understand data, interact with it, send commands to uh, robotic systems. So right now you're seeing various demos all playing at the same time for coolness factor uh, that show some of the work that we've done in virtual and augmented reality to control robotics, to give users a first person point of view in order to control a remote system that you could never actually go to in person. Uh, we've done a whole lot of work for maybe about five years now uh, since the beginning of this kind of uh, consumer revolution in VR and AR and we've started to build a lot of tools both for operating rovers, also operating robotics, helping out astronauts and clean room um, and a, very, a variety of other tasks. And so today I'm going to talk about a few of these tasks and show you just some quick uh, demos of some of the software that we've built. So the first task that I'd like to talk about is something that JPL has been excelling at for several decades, which is assembly of complicated spacecraft. Uh, making any spacecraft is uh, very complex and has to be a, a very precise process, especially because we can't repair them once they're out in space, or only very rarely. We've repaired, say, the Hubble mirror, for example. Um, but once something goes to Mars, if it doesn't work, if something breaks, and you don't have any sort of redundant backup, uh, you're pretty much screwed. So um, the process is very careful and we proceed with as much care as possible, starting off with sketches, then moving on to CAD models and very rough prototypes. And then these help to guide what the assembly phase looks like. And so we, when we move into assembly test and the pre-launch operations, um, we work in clean rooms and try to make things as accurate as possible following all the procedures that have been written up, but sometimes things don't go according to plan. Uh, this is a clean room accident that happened at Lockheed Martin where um, an NOAA satellite um, was not properly attached to the fixture that's used for changing its orientation. And so when they went to try to move it, it fell off because the bolts weren't attached. And so these procedural errors actually can happen a lot more easily than you might expect. Uh, things happen uh, that is, is it seems that it's outside of our control with our current tool set. So we, we've been starting to look at tools that could help reduce failures like this, uh, reduce anomalies like this, and also improve the experience uh, with respect to efficiency and development. So uh, we're all familiar with 3D printing technology, but there are limitations to 3D printing that you're no doubt aware of. Uh, needs to be scaled down in size. This scaling down makes it so there are certain features you can't represent at all, and so you need to change what the CAD model looks like in order for it to be 3D printed. And this process doesn't really take us very far in into thinking about things like, well, how are we going to put this together? Is this going to be enough clearance? 3D printing things at scale just really isn't an option. So we looked at um, the operation, which looking at other people's talks seems like this is a common desire right now. Can we view CAD models in augmented reality in, at full scale in a multi-user experience so we can discuss what people are looking at? 
and we build a product that we call Protospace. And this is a this is CAD viewing software that brings 3D designs into the world and solves problems before they're real. We built a pipeline that allows us to reduce models so that they're at the level that they can be um, viewed on a head-mounted display, specifically the HoloLens. And then we built an interface that allows us to interact with these models, both uh, things like rotate, translate, scale, but also looking at individual parts of the model, cutting into the model with planes to look at individual pieces of it, et cetera. And so here you see a video of some users. This is a mixed reality capture of uh, actually using Protospace. And uh, we can view CAD models at scale and view them on top of actual hardware prototypes if we want to compare and see maybe finished CAD with a sort of prototype structure. Um, we can look at what all of, the, all of the viewers are seeing from a sort of third party computer. Viewers can also, are all in a networked environment, so they can see what each other is looking at. They can communicate. Uh, you can program steps that show assembly step by step. They can point out things both with their hands, if they're there in person, as well as pointing out uh, virtually in the augmented reality space by setting points of interest. Uh, and this is showing that we can see through the mechanical assembly. Um, we can see the inside of the model. And so this tool right now, Protospace, is currently in use by several different missions within JPL. It's not just an experimental project. Uh, we're using it to develop the next generation Mars rover, Mars 2020, uh, as well as right now you can see the helicopter that we're planning to put on the Mars 2020 rover. We're also using it for Europa Clipper, um, for an ocean topography mission, as well as a number of other missions. But we don't just work uh, within NASA on unmanned exploration. There's also manned exploration. Most of this happens at Johnson Space Center, but at JPL we've also been working on augmented reality tools that can help human performance that, uh, up in the International Space Station. The ISS has uh, some unusual challenges that come with it, most of which are, are related to the problem of sending people there. We can send a small number of people up to the ISS, but they have to be extremely finely cross-trained in a number of disciplines. They're the plumbers, they're the electricians, they're the scientists. They do absolutely everything up there. And so it's actually not feasible to train them 100% in everything that they're going to be do up once they're up there. We might send them new experiments they didn't really know about when, when they were on the ground training. Procedures change while they're still up there. So. Um, we started looking at this as a problem. What are ways that we can remotely assist them and in both a manned and unmanned way, that is a manual and automatic type way, using augmented reality? And so we envisioned a system that would overlay procedural assistance in a 3D form on top of the user's view and could show them the individual steps of some complex procedural task. This is uh, an astronaut assembling a, assembling the cover to the cargo door after they've unloaded all of the cargo from a cargo spacecraft that had docked to the ISS. This is a, ta a task that all astronauts need to do, but they don't do it on a daily basis, and it's a relatively complicated procedure, so it makes a good target for something that they would need to look at the procedures and might not have all inside their head, something that needs procedural assistance. And we call this software Sidekick. It empowers the crew of the ISS with assistance when and where they need it. And so we started developing this tool, Sidekick, for the International Space Station. Um, this is showing an early prototype. Um, you can see here we have access to the procedures that the astronauts are used to reading, which up until now have been paper or occasionally on iPad. And they're available within this along with a 3D model of an, an animation of the procedure that they need to do. This is a mixed reality capture from HoloLens. So, after building this software, we then w took it uh, to a number of different testing areas to see how this would actually work for improving the performance of crews. And this is uh, NEMO, which is, an, which is an underwater crew training facility off the coast of Florida. We send astronauts there before they're sent up into space to live in an isolated area and practice procedures that they would need to actually use on the ISS. We sent our HoloLens and our Sidekick software there. We ran them through uh, different procedures, tested their efficiency. We saw greatly improved efficiency both for um, 
following a mixed reality procedure like you just saw, as well as a remote expert annotating and, and giving them guidance to accomplish a medical task. We then took our HoloLenses and we had to qualify them for microgravity use. So we went on NASA's parabolic flight test airplane, which we call the Vomit Comet, affectionately. And we tested the HoloLenses in microgravity um, because we needed to ensure that they could work and track the environment accurately, even if you don't have a gravity vector to rely on. So after all of this preparation and development, we sent uh, two HoloLenses up on SpaceX CRS-7 mission to the space station. But we were not prepared for what happened next because two minutes and 30 seconds into the flight of the Falcon 9 rocket, it experienced a rapid unplanned disassembly and um, exploded into bits off the Florida coast. So sometimes your launch goes poorly. Um, but six months later, we tried again and we successfully got our HoloLenses up to the space station and performed um, both a remote expert test and a guided uh, procedure test with astronaut Scott Kelly who was spending the year up in space. He even used the remote uh, expert view to show us the view of the Earth's curvature from the cupola of the ISS. So we saw that through the HoloLens pipeline. It was super cool. And one final uh, project that I wanted to talk about is related to Mars exploration. As you no doubt know, we have several orbiters as well as rovers on the Martian surface that are currently exploring it for our scientists. We have large teams dedicated to this as a task. And the scientists, what they really want to do is they want to go and walk on the surface of Mars. The, most of them are trained, we have many trained geologists and they spend all of their schooling going out into the field and looking at rocks. And then we uh, traditionally give them a computer and say, here, look at these pictures. You're a geologist on Mars now. But they can't walk around. They can't explore. They can't use their instincts. And so we wanted to take this problem and use mixed reality to solve it, to give them a headset where they could walk around the, the Martian surface. And this would allow them to go and find scientific targets that looked interesting, maybe a rock that is worthy of further investigation. Maybe we want to go and drill it or sample it chemically with a Curiosity rover's ChemCam or any number of other tasks that we might want to do. Um, it would allow them to label targets and say, hey, let's go explore this next, as well as collaborate with other scientists in order to discuss features that they're seeing on the Martian surface. And so first what we did is we worked on building a pipeline that on the back end could reconstruct the Martian surface in 3D based off of the 2D data that we had. So it's a 2D photogrammetric task. We have to use photogrammetry because the Curiosity rover isn't equipped with any sort of LIDAR. So we use photogrammetry to get real Mars uh, depth data extracted out of it as well as texture data. And then after reconstructing this point cloud and this textured mesh, what we did is we put it in, uh, initially in virtual reality, and then we moved it into augmented reality. And so this is a very early demo here. This is not our current product. Um, but you're seeing one of our first tests. This was before we had any sort of good room tracking solution, so we strapped Vicon uh, tracking markers onto an Oculus headset. And with this head-mounted display within our lab, we did a study to look at the efficacy of using this tool versus our traditional mission tools. The traditional mission tools were 2D panoramas that had been stitched together, essentially, and were shown on a flat desktop screen. And we compared that to our uh, virtual reality tool, which allowed a user to walk around the Martian surface reconstructed in 3D based off of the same image products that were being shown in 2D on the other tool. And we put users who were expert users of the official mission tool into an environment that we had constructed for testing, where they had to look around and they saw labeled rocks in 3D, uh, A, B, C, D, and what they had to do was then construct a, basically draw out a 2D overhead map of the area around them. So they were estimating where are these rocks actually and where are they in reference to each other and in reference to me. And we compared the performance of people using the official mission tool to accomplish that task versus using the HMD. Most of these HMD users note that this was in 2013, almost, I think only one of them had ever put an HMD on their head before, and 
uh, all of them, they only had about a minute of training before we actually set them to the task. But you can see here that in this plot, um, the red X's are the traditional tool and uh, the Y axis is showing error in angular distance estimation in terms of degrees, whereas the X axis is angular, which sorry, is, is estimated distance error, estimating the distance of each of the obstacles. The traditional mission tool users are really literally all over the map in terms of their estimations of where objects are, but all of the green clustered circles in the bottom are the distance error for the HMD users, and so we really saw that we more than doubled our distance accuracy and more than tripled our angular accuracy in estimation after a, this very simple test using an HMD. So this really propelled us to want to develop a fully fleshed out tool. And so we made a tool called OnSite and we launched it uh, internally to coincide with the launch of um, the Microsoft HoloLens. We were one of the launch partners. And what OnSite does is it enables scientists to work on Mars from their offices. And what you're seeing right here, um, this is, it doesn't show the on-site interface, but this is 3D reconstructed terrain from within on-site. And so in the HoloLens, the users are walking around this terrain. They're able to navigate around it both in sort of room space walking mode as well as long distance navigation teleportation mode. They can annotate it in various different ways and it's shared over the network with other scientists and engineers. And this is currently being used by Mars science and engineering users in a number of different ways. Mars scientists are examining the Martian surface. Every time we get new data downlinked from Curiosity, our pipeline automatically makes the newest meshes and integrates them in so that when you put, when you start up the on-site application, you can be taken to the most recent reconstruction of Mars. Uh, scientists use this to talk about science targets, to choose science targets. Recently, we found mud cracks on Mars and they were first spotted inside this on-site tool. And engineers also use on-site to get an idea of what's around the rover, what safety concerns are, what obstacles are nearby. And they do this at the beginning of every Martian day or SOL as they're starting operations. Uh, we also wanted to share this with the public, so we created a tool called Destination Mars, and uh, this allows a virtual Buzz Aldrin to take you around our reconstructed Martian terrain, give you a guided tour, and give you a little bit of insight into what it might be like someday if we take humans to Mars. Destination Mars debuted in Kennedy Space Center last year. It just closed up. Uh, tens of thousands of people were able to experience this HoloLens experience there. And so what all of these tools that we're working on allow us to do is uh, they allow us to explore foreign worlds at a distance. Protospace, we hope someday, uh, will be one of the tools that we use to prototype and develop a ship that might take, a, take astronauts to Mars. And while astronauts are on that ship and they're far away from help, maybe several light minutes away from remote assistance, they'll be able to get automated assistance with a tool like Sidekick in mixed reality. And then once they get there, we'll be able to uh, have earthbound scientists and engineers help them as if, feeling as if they were actually there with the same sort of proprioceptive cues and understanding of the environment as the astronauts that are on site using our tool on site to understand Mars better. And so what this will allow all of us to do is to become telenauts, those that explore the world that's far away from us as if it were actually in our living rooms. Thank you very much.